It is uh, our honor to have uh, with us uh, today Professor Michele Zorzi. Let me introduce uh, Michele. Michele is a uh, uh, professor of telecommunications at the School of Engineering in the University of Padova uh, since uh, 2003. And he received the, the laureate degree and the PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Padua in Italy in 1994. Prior to his current appointment, he was a faculty member at the Polytechnico di Milano and a research scientist at the Center for Wireless Communication, University of California in San Diego, and associate professor and then professors in the University of Ferrara. He has many international collaborations and he has been a PI and co PI of numerous research projects, both in Europe and in the US, as well as more than 20 other projects funded by different funding agencies and industrial companies. Today, Michele will give a seminar on the design, simulation, and optimization of multimodal underwater networks. Um, thank you again, Michele, to be here, and uh, I give you the stage. Thank you, Julia, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So let me share my screen with the presentation. So you should see it now in presentation mode. Yes? Yes. Okay. Right. All right. Okay. All right. So again, good afternoon. Uh, so as Julia said, uh, uh, I'm going to describe a little bit of work we did uh, in the past uh, few years on the topic of uh, underwater communication and especially uh, multimodal <clears throat> underwater communications and underwater networks. Now, as agreed uh, with Julia, uh, I will um, leave a copy of the slides. We can uh, have them if you wish. But also, if you want to interrupt for clarification, so if something is not clear and uh, clarifying it is helpful for the presentation, then I invite you to do that. Uh, if instead your question is more general or requires uh, a bit of uh, uh, discussion, then uh, um, it's probably better to wait until the end where we'll, we will have uh, a question and answer session where we can address you know, any doubts or, or questions you may have. And of course, you know, any time you want clarifications, even after this talk, my email address is on the first and last slide. So you can certainly feel free to uh, drop me an email and uh, ask me anything, which I will then probably divert to some of my collaborators uh, whose contribution to this work, of course, is uh, um, very large. Uh, some of them you will see as co-authors of the papers, uh, uh, Filippo Campagnaro, uh, first of all, and uh, other students that I had. So the focus here is uh, essentially on our own work. <clears throat> so I will uh, provide maybe some pointers at the end uh, to existing projects uh, and some recent papers in this area. But what I'm going to talk about during the talk is mostly work we did in Padova on this topic. So the motivation, uh, of course, is that uh, you know, after many years in which uh, uh, underwater communications has been mostly used for um, military applications, uh, we have now um, a lot of interest uh, in other applications beyond military, uh, going from environmental monitoring to um, sensors, uh, to even the internet of underwater things, uh, uh, remote control for equipment, uh, you know, oil and gas applications uh, and, and all that. And uh, clearly, you know, all these applications will have different uh, objectives compared to military uh, operations uh, and will have different requirements. Uh, and so it is important to address these requirements and with uh, applications such as monitoring uh, or, or data collection uh, or study and research, uh, then we may need uh, uh, other types of uh, traffic to be supported like uh, high definition video in real time or the transfer of large data files, uh, be it data or images. And this uh, clearly puts uh, a very large strain on the systems, which typically are not you know, able to provide the very high data rates. And so how to deal with these issues and how to 
satisfy or approach these requirements is clearly a very interesting and um, important question in this uh, in this area. So you can think of an underwater network, uh, and, and I realize that I'm, you know, talking to people who have seen some of this uh, in the past, uh, and and maybe are even working in this area. So uh, bear with me if I'm being a bit redundant, or maybe I talk about things that you already know. But just to set the stage, you know, this is the kind of uh, environment you may you may have with the uh, uh, static sensors, maybe installed on the seafloor. You may have ships that act as uh, um, communication nodes. Then you have buoys uh, that uh, are not static, but not they're not mob mobile either. Then you have uh, UAVs, uh, which are uh, you know vehicles that may travel underwater and go around to do certain things. And then of course you may have uh, an access point on the shore, which would be the gateway to the large internet and to all the applications that uh, the internet provides. Now, clearly in this environment, you need uh, a means uh, to send bits between nodes. And so several technologies have been considered during the years. Uh, uh, there are essentially three kinds of technologies. Uh, one is uh, electromagnetics based, the other is acoustics based, and the other one, even though it's still electromagnetics, I guess, but that's optical, which is separated by uh, radio and magnetic type of environment. So RF communication is actually uh, not a very uh, appealing option. Uh, it has been experimented and some links actually may work, but over very short distances. Uh, and you need uh, to operate at very low frequencies, which have uh, you know, the a significant drawback of requiring nodes and antennas of very large size. Okay, so we're talking about uh, literally kilometers, which is, you know, a bit uh, hard to implement. <clears throat> uh, communication, you know, of light in the deep sea is used by animals, uh, so we were not inventing anything here, but we're just observing that some means to communicate uh, has been used uh, for many, many years or, or millennia, I guess by uh, living beings, uh, so both acoustic and optics is actually uh, methods that uh, different animals use in the sea, right? And so that was optics, and this is clearly acoustic, where especially mammals use sound to uh, send messages to each other. And so mimicking that kind of uh, um, communication system that uh, animal species have developed through evolution, we try to uh, use uh, analogous uh, communication uh, techniques to do that. Uh, so acoustics is uh, probably the most popular and has the characteristic of being long range, but low rate. Uh, it's uh, heavily affected in multipath, especially in uh, scenarios where you have uh, shallow water or you have anyway, uh, a large amount of uh, reflection. Uh, so for example, also uh, some coastal environments uh, or some harbor environments where there is a lot of interest in implementing these communication techniques, even under sea, you have uh, a very difficult propagation environment, which needs to be dealt with. Uh, plus, you know, anything that uses acoustics have to face uh, acoustic noise, which in a, you know, marine environment, a harbor environment even more, you know, you may have uh, ship, wind, uh, waves, uh, even animals sometimes, uh, you know, the famous uh, clicking shrimp uh, may produce noise uh, of different kinds to these type of systems. Electromagnetics, I mentioned uh, already, and uh, in most cases, you know, very short range, uh, but potentially high rate, especially RF. And then optical which is also short range, even though the range for optical depends a lot on the, uh, the environmental conditions, uh, uh, because clearly the noise in this case is other sources of light, plus any turbulence or disturbance or bubbles in the water that may interfere with the propagation of light. Uh, and so potentially, of course, since we're using uh, very you know, optical frequencies, and so this, uh, you know, the frequency is very high, and so potentially the bandwidth is also very large. Uh, but 
you know, only short range, uh, and, and also there are requirements of line of sight, of pointing, that may make this uh, more difficult to implement than it seems. But this is definitely of interest, and in fact, is more and more considered in uh, uh, underwater scenarios as an alternative, uh, or, or maybe as a complement, as I will try to argue during this presentation, for acoustic communication. So I have the, uh, a few slides, you know, listing pros and cons of different technologies. Uh, some of these I already mentioned. Uh, so for acoustics, you know, it's uh, been studied for many years. So it's very proven technology. There are a lot of devices and commercial products there that have been tested and, and used uh, for, for decades. Uh, there is no need for line of sight. Uh, the range is uh, quite large, up to tens of kilometers. It's uh, robust in some environments, uh, especially in deep water and uh, in the vertical direction. Uh, although it's not so robust, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in shallow water or you know, highly reflective environments. Uh, it's been studied uh, a lot. And so there are quite some models uh, that have been uh, used uh, and that have been proposed. Uh, and so there are standardized uh, simulation tools and, and channel models, for example, bellhop or even stochastic models that have been used for comparison. And, and as a benchmark for different techniques. And so this is you know, a, a mature field, you, you could say. Uh, disadvantages is that, of course, there is uh, noise and multipath, as I mentioned. Uh, it's quite heavy on power consumption. Uh, the bit rates are at the best a few kilobits per second, more often, especially in long range, you know, hundreds or tens of bits per second. Uh, it's affected by the uh, characteristics of the behavior of sound in water, and there are some effects that are, you know, unseen in uh, uh, radio propagation. For example, you know, we know radio propagation very well, and, and we kind of have this mindset where we translate what we know about radio into different environments. Well, here you find something which is very different. You have, for example, a sound speed gradient through the the depth of the water where you have bending waves or bending signals that may create the shallow zones or may make you know, a farther node more easily be reachable than a close by node. So these are things that are kind of counterintuitive because the physics behind this is uh, quite uh, complex. Another big issue and big difference of acoustic communication with respect to radio is uh, the, la the large latency because speed of sound is actually not very much, you know, 1500 meters per second, compare it with, uh, you know, 300, you know, three, three, 10 to the eight meters per second of, um, you know, radio or light propagation. And so this makes uh, um, latency quite high, which has an impact on uh, uh, interference considerations, on protocol design considerations, which, uh, may become important when it comes to non-trivial environments. And finally, there is also a, you know, a biological or, or, or an environmental effect, which is uh, the fact that marine life, besides using these acoustic signals to communicate, uh, will be affected because they, they could hear, they can hear some of these signals, and these may become uh, a nuisance, if not uh, a danger for them. This type of uh, uh, technique has been used in many, many areas, uh, and it's the dominant technology today, uh, as you probably know. So EM, uh, let me not spend much time here. Uh, as uh, acoustics, it doesn't need line of sight. Uh, uh, unlike acoustics, it has large bandwidth, and uh, it has low latency, because now we're talking about electromagnetic waves, so the speed of propagation is uh, much, much larger. Uh, it has good performance, especially in fresh, shallow water, uh, whereas, uh, you know, in salty water, this, uh, there, is, there are, you know, electric, electrical effects that uh, create a lot of attenuation, and so there's a problem there. Another uh, you know, good property of electromagnetic signals is that they can cross the uh, boundary between uh, air and water, for example. So if you communicate below water, with electromagnetic signals, uh, they can cross the boundary and go into the air, which of course is not the case for, for uh, acoustics uh, typically. Uh, 
And so this is another feature there. Disadvantage is that uh, you know sh the, the range is very short uh, and there are not many products. Uh, it's susceptible, susceptible to electromagnetic interference and, and also it may impact marine life uh, as well. And there are very few products here. And this uh, frankly is not considered as a very competitive technology because it has many issues and it's actually uh, dominated to some extent by optical, which uh, has good advantages uh, and maybe fewer disadvantages. Maybe the biggest disadvantage uh, of uh, optical, uh, besides the relatively short range, but not so short because you can go up to tens of meters in good water, uh, is that you need clean water because otherwise, clearly, you know, it's, uh, it's not possible to communicate well. Uh, and uh, you need line of sight uh, and uh, a good alignment because if you want to have a very directive beam of light, then of course you better have your receiver within uh, the uh, very narrow angle where this light is, uh, is emitted. And so this creates issues, especially for example, for buoys that are uh, continuously floating and moving and, and uh, you know, whose uh, position and, and rotation is continuously perturbed by the movement of water. And so this is something that we need to deal with, obviously. And so if you compare these technologies, uh, uh, you can use, for example, a graph like this, where you have you know, range on the X axis in meters, and you have bit rate, achievable bit rate on the Y axis. And of course, what you expect is that going from left to right, you go from top to bottom because as you increase the distance, you expect the bit rate to go down. But you see that the three technologies are not so much competing with each other, but they are rather complementing each other, especially if you look at the blue and red regions, you know, the, the light blue region, which is RF and magnetic, is kind of kind of dominated, as I mentioned earlier, because, uh, you know, for the same range, uh, uh, optical will do better in terms of bitrate, even though, you know, this is kind of a generic statement and it, this really should be uh, qualified by saying something about the environment. But in general, you know, you can say that uh, probably using optical gives you a similar advantages and fewer disadvantages than uh, RF. Uh, and so if we look at all the, these two, so let's say we ignore the RF uh, technology for now, when we assume that the competing technologies are uh, the optical and uh, RF, uh, then you can see that you know they, they clearly complement each other because for long range uh, your only choice is going to be acoustics, and for short range you can go with optical. If you want high rate communication, then uh, it's a kind of necessary to go for optical and to make sure that you can do that, uh, meaning. Uh, you have a requirement on the distance between the two devices. And so this you know, sets uh, some uh, uh, constraints on what uh, you can do. What is clear is that if you have a complex system where you have different needs and different requirements, uh, and you know, one obvious example, which I'll make uh, later as well, is when you have uh, sensors and uh, you have a, an AUV, a, a you know, a, a robot essentially that uh, navigates underwater, and you have at least two needs in that case. One need is uh, uh, a communication between the AUV and a sensor to retrieve the data that the sensor has accumulated. And this can be done at high rate if the AUV is able to approach the sensor and be close enough so that a high rate interface can be used. Be it, be it optical or maybe even high frequency acoustics. On the other hand, uh, another need, which is clearly there, is uh, the need with, for communication with the AUV for navigation and control purposes, where uh, the distance may be very large because then the AUV can span a large area and uh, should be continuously in communication with some control node, the ship or a, or a shore node, which is in charge of uh, telling the AUV what the mission should be or, or to solve uh, you know, situations that are uh, unpredictable. And so for that kind of communication, which is more like a control channel, which just needs uh, not many bits per second, then of course an acoustic link is uh, 
uh, or maybe completely adequate. And so a system where these two type of communication coexist uh, is, is kind of natural as soon as uh, in, your system is not completely trivial, which just needs you know point-to-point -point communication of a single kind. Okay, and so it's useful to uh, realize from this graph uh, how what the technologies can do, because then you may decide what kind of applications or what what kind of communication needs to assign to either of those, uh, or you can decide how to switch from one to the other, uh, depending on uh, the data data rate requirements uh, as well as uh, depending on distance. Now, other more uh, subtle points that may arise uh, in uh, studying these uh, technologies. And, and I, I mentioned it already, but let me say it again. One thing that we found very interesting in this uh, environment is that there are some things that we essentially take for granted or uh, we you know, tacitly assume as true because they come from our own knowledge of uh, radio propagation and radio communication. And sometimes, you know, in this acoustic environment, we have to face the reality that uh, things may be conceptually different. Right? So there are some differences that are not just uh, a difference in performance. It's not just say, oh, a more difficult channel instead of being able to transport 10 megabits per second, it can only transport five, okay? So that would be you know, a degraded kind of performance. Here you have changes of paradigm because things are completely different conceptually. So in radio, you know, long delays essentially don't exist unless you go to satellite communications or, or you know, extreme types of environments uh, or extremely high data rates where even small distances may electromagnetically be, be large. But here you have uh, uh, easily delays that are much larger than the transmission time of your packet. And uh, uh, so you have that, you know, what we usually consider as instantaneous, the propagation of signals from one point to another, uh, in this case is not, okay? So here you can see that if I have propagation delay of one second and two seconds, then, uh, Typically, you know, if you work with the TDMA frames where you assign communication channels to time slots within a frame, then in order to make sure that uh, two separate channels do not interfere with each other, you typically introduce the guard times, which take into account the propagation delays. And in radio, these are very, very small because you know, it's a small fraction, and so there is no problem there, essentially. Whereas here, they may easily be larger than the actually slot where you transmit data. And so this poses a problem of efficiency, which is quite significant, but also it poses uh, some interesting opportunities because knowing that, you know, if uh, a packet takes a long time to go from one point to another, even two packets that are sent exactly at the same time over different distances, they may arrive to the receiver non-overlapping. And so this makes scheduling a bit more interesting and a lot more difficult because your optimization problem, which is typically what you solve when you want to find the optimal schedule, uh, becomes very hard because you have the time dimension also to take into account, which makes things much more uh, difficult there, but you see the point, right? You can have parallel transmissions without collisions if you time them accordingly. Um, and so this is a challenge as well as an opportunity. Uh, another thing about long delays is that of course, you know, traditional MAC protocols, access protocols used in radio, uh, like uh, carrier sense multiple access or, you know, Wi-Fi itself, uh, which rely on carrier sensing because the assumption is that what I hear now is what it is now. In, in this kind of scenarios, what I hear now may have happened a few seconds earlier. And so if I react to that, it's much too late. And so other things need to be, to be considered there and, and other techniques may have to be uh, developed. But there's also a near-far issue. Well, this is there also in radio. Uh, 
So if you have collisions, then you may still survive collisions because if two packets arrive at the receiver with different received power, then uh, you may be able to still correctly decode the stronger one while losing the, the, the weaker one. Uh, or you can even go further saying, oh, if I can decode the best signal, I can actually reproduce it and cancel it. And so go through schemes called uh, interference cancellation type of, uh, or, or you know, simultaneous uh, decoding, which you know, are quite advanced, uh, but uh, you know, they are studied and they're even used in, in systems in the radio or terrestrial world. Uh, here, maybe things are a bit, uh, a bit behind in the, in the other water because of the challenges we have, but clearly these are op options and opportunities that in the future may be available. Now with optical communication, let me say something about that. Uh, so the transmission depends on the alignment between the transmission and receiver, because uh, unlike uh, you know, acoustics, this is typically directional. Uh, ambient light noise, which may come from uh, many different sources. The sunlight is the most obvious, uh, but also you may have, uh, if this is uh, on, a, on a robot that is doing something in, in a deep seat, then it may have its own lights, which may interfere with this communication. Uh, you may have uh, other sources of light from marine life, uh, or, or if you're close to the surface, you know, even during the night, you may have the moon or stars or coast lights there. Uh, now, the way optical signals behave in the water is uh, characterized by these attenuation coefficients, which gives you, you know, the, the attenuation per meter, uh, which is a combination of different effects, absorption and scattering uh, being the two more significant. And I'm providing here some numbers. And we studied this also experimentally in a paper that is mentioned at the bottom of the slide there. And so one thing that, uh, that is uh, nice about this area of research uh, is that uh, you, know, you get to do things that you typically don't do while studying more traditional topics. Uh, uh, for example, you get to do cruises uh, in the exotic locations. And so I've never done that, unfortunately, but uh, you know, some of my students and Filippo certainly has participated in quite a few of them. This is one of them, probably the most uh, exotic and, and the, the longest uh, of those. I think it, they were out uh, like two weeks. And they, you know, they uh, uh, went along the coast of Morocco and then the Sahara Desert. And in doing that, they made a lot of measurements and experiments. And one goal of this campaign was to make optical measurements. And so uh, to, to be able to characterize uh, in several different uh, situations, they even happened to encounter a sandstorm, which uh, produced uh, you know, a lot of turbidity in the water. And that was interesting to see what can be expected when uh, uh, you know, visibility in the water or transparency of the water is, is very much compromised uh, as in this case. And so you know, there were a lot of uh, um, measurements made. Uh, so these are the uh, pictures from there. And these are some of the devices which are actually quite big uh, in size uh, to measure uh, characteristics uh, of the water, uh, you know, the chemical properties of the water, as well as a measure levels of light at different depths, which is this device to the right, which measures, uh, you know, light intensity at different depths in the water. And so some of the measurements may look like this. So as a function of depth, you measure these attenuation parameters. Of course, the more you are to the right, the worse the performance will be. And so uh, typically, you know, in, in deep water, things are good because you don't have disturbances. Uh, uh, and in addition, as shown by this picture, you have a quite stable behavior, whereas uh, closer to the surface, uh, where for example, uh, you, know, you may have uh, uh, organisms that are floating close to the surface and they will interfere with the uh, uh, light propagation and provide uh, a much higher value for this, uh, attenuation coefficient. So this explains why this curves go to the right as you move towards the surface. And then, as I said, in addition to this, which is about attenuation, 
close to the surface, you also have much more noise because clearly the closer you are to the surface, the more uh, sunlight will play a role if you're doing this during the day. But there are models, you see, that uh, can be fitted by uh, experimental data. And so you can apply this both in simulation and in the, uh, maybe statistical analysis to provide some guidelines for the, uh, the design and performance evaluation of communication systems and networks. Uh, these are other you know, experimental data, but still, uh, you know, this is the level of noise, as I was mentioning, obviously, as you expect, as you go up, then things become a little uh, difficult there. Uh, so you can build a model, you know, signal to noise ratio, we know very well what that means. Uh, in, in the, you know, optical communications, you may have different types of noise, it's just, just thermal noise, as in the typical, you know, radio system, but you know, these are things well studied and well characterized. And so you can uh, certainly build a model where uh, you can find the signal to noise ratio and then based on that, uh, evaluate the performance of your communication system. Now you can also uh, look at uh, coverage areas. Uh, so this, uh, we have the transmitter in the, in the red uh, diamond there in, in the middle of each graph. And then you have two contours, uh, the, so these are, I don't know if you can see it, there are two colors. One is black, the other is blue. The black one is uh, with sunlight noise. And so clearly this is much more restricted because to have good reception, then it must be very close because there's a lot of noise. Whereas without sunlight, then you have a much larger uh, coverage area as you expect. And also as you move towards the bottom, so move away from the surface, of course the effect of light becomes smaller. And so the two contours are less differentiated and they're bigger. Okay, and of course there is many things you can do in terms of characterizing or, or uh, applying different uh, radiation uh, diagrams. Uh, you know, this is uh, taken from the data sheet, I think of a Bluecom optical uh, transducer. And so you can uh, include all of these characteristics into your simulation tool if you need uh, to, to provide you know, a more realistic type of evaluation. Uh, this is a measurement uh, of uh, the performance of the blue comb, which is an optical transducer there. Um, so this is a uh, range as a function of the attenuation parameter C. Of course, the more, the higher C, which is the attenuation parameter, uh, the lower the range. So going right to left in this graph, the two curves correspond to two uh, different situations. One is uh, uh, deep water, so essentially no, no sunlight or very little sunlight. The other is uh, uh, shallow water, but at night, so sun is not there, but even the moon and the stars uh, uh, played some role, as you can see that the blue curve is a bit lower than the red curve, which corresponds to this performance degradation there. Uh, and these are other uh, measurements that we, we did there. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, one interesting thing is that given that these te technologies are complementary, so they, they have different features, they uh, address different needs. Uh, in any system where you have multiple needs of possibly very different kinds, then it is clearly uh, an advantage to uh, try to put these things uh, together, right? So figure on page 26, let me go back there. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so this is a, this is a weird, uh, uh, so this is how it was produced. Uh, don't ask me why. You should actually look at it flipped, right? So you, can, you should look at what is the maximum range as a function of C. Uh, so if you, uh, you know, flip the, the, the figure and what is now the y axis you put horizontal and the x axis it makes easier it becomes easier to interpret because now you know as c changes which is a function of the uh, water conditions uh, and the, the environment uh, then correspondingly the maximum range you can achieve provides uh, uh, becomes uh, smaller so the control parameter here or the variable that we change to study the system is c is not the range there sorry about that Okay, so that was a solved issue. So uh, 
Okay, so uh, you know these multimodal systems uh, are able to uh, provide uh, a means to serve different needs. Uh, also, even though admittedly this is uh, um, you know the the performance is very different, but you can still provide a backup channel with a more robust technology if uh, the uh, better but less robust technology should fail and which is typically the case you know between optical and uh, acoustics uh, in addition you can have uh, new applications because knowing that you have in parallel a control channel and a high speed data channel may enable applications that you know with the uh, acoustics only type of uh, communications uh, was actually not envisioned okay so it's of interest then to study, you know, how these multimodal networks uh, work. Uh, uh, so, for example, you know, how to you know, combine optimal technologies, uh, how to evaluate them, how to switch from one to the other. Uh, so these are these are uh, scenarios that we considered uh, just to show you, you know, what a complex scenario could be. So there are divers that do something in a certain area. Each one has its own area. And then to provide data that has been collected, uh, they have some rendezvous points where they may encounter a leader and which then receives the data. And then the leader himself has uh, a rendezvous point with the uh, ROV, the, the remote operating vehicle, who can then suck the data and uh, send it somewhere else. And so you have, you, you see mobility patterns on areas of different sizes, and you can have encounter points where there's an exchange of data at high rate. Whereas, of course, all of these entities, all these nodes will have low rate continuous communications for uh, safety and uh, for control purposes. And so this is something that is of interest uh, in a number of uh, scenarios. Uh, another thing is that, uh, you know, once you have uh, multiple technologies, uh, then you have multiple topologies superimposed because here you see this is low frequency acoustics and essentially all nodes have it and all nodes can communicate with that because that's the longest range available and then you may have a mid frequency acoustics which uh, uh, is only available on relatively short distances or, or on clean channels, whereas in other channels, this is not there, either because the node does not have the transducer or because the distance between the two nodes is such that this technology cannot be used. And so you may have you know, multiple technologies or multiple topologies superimposed uh, to each other. And so you may think of MAC problems, scheduling problems, and routing problems uh, with this multidimensional type of scenario, which makes it more interesting and more complex to deal with. And so you may do other things and you may set up uh, optimization problems uh, differently with many constraints and many degrees of freedom. And this is something that you know is there in some of the work we did. Uh, I guess this is something that I mentioned already there. So just to give you a, an idea of uh, how things go. So let's say you have this AUV that goes around this uh, trajectory, passing by these eight nodes. So it goes uh, you know, clockwise uh, at a certain speed and uh, it has two transducers. And then uh, we want to use the one which is most adequate in any given situation. So at, at any given point in time and space. Uh, to study this, uh, we use uh, the uh, communication framework or simulation framework that we developed called Desert Underwater, which is based on NS2, and uh, it has you know, fairly complete protocol stacks. So in this case, for example, the multi-stack controller, the multi-controller is at the physical layer. So you do, it sits below the Mac. And so this just switches between physical layers according to the relative performance. You may be more advanced and have this multi-stack controller above the Mac layer because maybe different physical layers, optical versus acoustics, may perform better with different Mac layers accordingly. And so it does not necessarily make sense to have a common Mac layer and then only switch between physical layers. You may have a bigger stack between which to switch. Uh, so this is what uh, was done here. And so uh, this is the rule. You know, that there is essentially two thresholds, uh, one threshold which 
leads us to switching from acoustics to optical uh, when the optical communication becomes better than acoustics and then another threshold to switch back the reason why the two thresholds are not equal because you want to have some hysteresis to avoid uh, you know ping-ponging between the two during the short time and so this is you know typical of control systems and so we can uh, do that so essentially what we do we measure the quality of the interfaces and once this becomes uh, lower than a certain threshold, then we enforce the switch. And so the uh, data rate you can achieve at uh, any point in space, which means also in time, is represented here where the darker regions uh, and bigger dots represent you know, higher data rates than we expect. And so in close proximity of each node, you have a higher data rate and, and vice versa when you're far away. Now, another uh, Interesting application is remote control. So it, it's becoming more and more of interest, especially in oil and gas operation or maybe explorations or port, you know, harbor type of environments to have uh, robots that operate underwater and they have to do things or to perform some tasks, including collecting data, collecting images and video, uh, monitor things, uh, and uh, they need to be controlled from shore because these are unmanned type of devices. Uh, what is done today is they have a cord called umbilical, which you know, is used to provide power as well as uh, an optical fiber for uh, high-speed communication. But this, you know, especially in some environments which are complex, think of a complex uh, you know, offshore uh, oil uh, uh, plant with lots of pipes and, and, and uh, you know, things uh, in between. Uh, then it becomes uh, challenging to move around in these environments with the cord, uh, which may get entangled, may break some things, may break itself. And so things are uh, a bit uh, uh, risky there. So being able to do away with uh, the cable would actually be a big advantage in this case. And so that's why we're studying a lot of uh, wireless solutions for this kind of environments. Uh, and so at sufficient close distance, of course, you can have a high speed uh, uh, communication link using optics uh, for long range, uh, again, for control, navigation, or maybe mission updates, then you may rely on acoustics, which is, uh, uh, you know, has the data rate you need uh, while providing a much higher robustness compared to optics. And so what we did in our study is to define several modes of operation, uh, you know, defined essentially by the data rate in this case, but you can also have uh, requirements of uh, latency, for example, which also will make optics much more favorable than acoustics. And then uh, you have different interfaces for these. Uh, and according to the different situation, you can use one or the other. For example, here is uh, similar to what we said before. This is, uh, um, again, a, a robot which uh, has to follow a given trajectory to perform some mission. And what we're measuring here is uh, the uh, data rate on the top part of the figure. Uh, again, the darker, the higher. And on the bottom, you have a deviation in meters from the expected or the expected trajectory. And you can see that uh, you know, in some points where you know, you're far from the uh, control point, which is in the middle, and therefore communication is uh, weaker. And also here you can see the trajectory changes direction sharply. And so you expect more errors there. Uh, this is what you actually find because uh, you know, here you may have a small departure, but still you know, it's within one or two meters. So it's not too bad compared to a distance which is in hundreds of meters. And so this shows that you can actually control quite well these devices using this kind of technologies. Uh, you can even go multi-hop. So uh, it doesn't have to be uh, just point to point. In a, in a more complex environment where you have larger distances, you may even have multi-hop communications. And there you may have other issues like interference between neighboring nodes or between parallel transmissions in a, in a mesh network or a line network. Uh, you may have routing decisions to make. And so this becomes uh, a bit uh, more challenging. So this is another study we did recently. Uh, so this is the architecture that we simulate. So we had the applications up here. So you have, for example, uh, video low quality images, video high quality color, video high quality gray scale, and, and all these. 
and then you may have you know the, the traffic control and then the lower layers so the mac layer which you she has mentioned earlier uh, it doesn't have to be the same for different uh, physical interfaces so for example for optics you use tdma because guard times are not a problem whereas here you may use csma for whatever reason and so if you measure what you can achieve uh, see this is throughput as a function of distance for different technologies and so you can see that overall at close distance as you expect you can achieve megabits per second mostly provided by the blue technology which is video and and then other lower quality videos and, and other things so this is something that we can characterize by simulating and so we can make choices about what to use and what to expect at different distances. There are also some more subtle studies. So let me just mention them and then you can refer to the paper if, you, if you're interested. See, here is the um, comparison between the transmitted data rate and the received data rate. And so the transmitter is the gray line here and the red line is the received data rate. Here we mix traffic. So we have a video which requires periodic transmission of uh, frames. And then we have images that sometimes get produced and are sent. And they occupy a lot of channel resources. So you don't do something to control the traffic. When an image is produced, uh, it monopolizes, you know, it takes all the data rate uh, and the video starts, which is what you see here, right? The red curve, which is the received data rate for video, goes to zero for all this much time, which is the time the channel is occupied by the image. And so you need to do some traffic shaping type of uh, action where you force the image packets to be spaced instead of you know, filling the queue once the image is produced and, and get highest priority over everything else, you may enforce something. And if you do that, uh, you know, the red curve becomes the yellow curve. And so it follows the transmit data rate much more nicely, which means that you're not uh, interfering with the video traffic uh, a whole lot. And so that video traffic will get good performance. And correspondingly, you know, if you do this traffic shaping, then your delay from uh, relatively high becomes much more acceptable there. Just as an example, you know, of the results we can produce there. Um, So uh, another a few words about how to design and evaluate these networks. Uh, so we have uh, you know, a full-blown methodology, which goes from requirements to design, analysis and simulation, C trial, deployment, and back and forth between these, uh, because you, you know, based on the C trial, you can uh, collect data, which then you can use to feed a simulation offline. So this is a technique which is, uh, you know, quite uh, widely used. Uh, and so, you know, there's a lot you can do here with uh, the, the uh, collaboration between these different phases of the evaluation. So as I mentioned already, Desert Underwater, which is, you know, open source, public available, and uh, you can download it and use it. And I, I believe that, uh, you know, the, the guys at TII uh, are doing that, or at least uh, considered that. Uh, one interesting feature of this is that the same code that is used for simulation can be used for emulation as well. So you can actually cut the protocol stack of the simulator and attach the higher layers to a, a physical device. So to an actual modem. And so instead of simulating the physical layer or even the data link, uh, you can actually use, replace the simulation code with the actual device with its own embedded code, which makes you know, things of course uh, more realistic. This is the two options I was mentioning earlier about where to put the multi a controller to switch between the different uh, uh, options there. Uh, so one thing that I wanted to mention here, I know it's a bit late, but let me maybe take a few more minutes here. Uh, a use case example, which uh, has to do with optimal multimodal scheduling. Right? Here, you know, we have two superimposed, or three in this case, superimposed topologies where you can have, according to the availability of transducers and to the distances, you can have availability of different links of different colors, if you wish, of different you know, technologies that can run in parallel, and you may need to optimize them together. Right? One thing you can do is you can say, well, I, I assign certain types of traffic to a certain technology, thereby I separate the networks logically, and then I optimize them separately. Or you can say, well, I'm trying to do all of it at the same time, 
And so this results in a big optimization problem. Uh, I don't even try to go through the problem here. Let me just mention that this essentially does the following. Right? It tries to optimize the resource uh, allocation so the, the utilization of the, of the channel. So it tries to utilize as much as the transmission resources as possible under some constraints in terms of, uh, well, there are some feasibility constraints, like you cannot use a technology you don't have, or you cannot exceed the amount of transducers you have or the data rate that's available. So these are feasibility constraints. But then you, you have uh, other things that uh, you know, try to uh, favor, for example, so point D here, you assign more slots to nodes with more neighbors because you know that they will need more resources there. Uh, in each frame, a node transmits uh, only once. Uh, yeah, provide relay nodes a time slot after their neighbors so that you can have a multi-hop transmission over a short time scale, which you know, improves the, the latency. So we came up with a you know, large set of constraints and, and that is something that you can try to improve or to optimize uh, there. Uh, and so the, the results which have been obtained here with the you know, setup which is described uh, here and is benchmarked against uh, you know, traditional solutions like TDMA or Aloha. Uh, and this is what uh, we obtain. Right? So this is the CDF of the delay. And so this curve, you know, the the more the curve is to the left, the better the delay performance, which is what happens to OMS, which is uh, optimal uh, multi-mode scheduling uh, compared to the traditional schemes, which have a, a larger delay, even you know, sometimes uh, twice or three times as large. Then throughput, same thing, you have CDF. In this case, uh, you know, better performance is farther to the right because you want larger throughput. Uh, and so this is what you can see. And again, the solid black line is the uh, OMS solution, which is the highest uh, compared to the other, the dashed and the dotted, which are the Aloha and TDMA. Uh, you can appreciate you know, the improvement you can have uh, there. And you also, we also provide uh, some information about uh, the performance achieved by the individual technologies, uh, the individual. Here we have three acoustics technologies, uh, low frequency, medium frequency, and high frequency, which have their own data rates and their own uh, performance according to the, the characteristics of the propagation in the water at the frequencies being used. Uh, so the simulation results show that you know, OMS can do better. Uh, TDMA performs poorly uh, because uh, you know, it's, it's less flexible and uh, the issue of guard times will result in a heavy inefficiency. And so that is, uh, you know, at, at some point we dropped it because there was no point in studying it uh, in these type of scenarios because it was uh, significantly lower in performance than uh, the other solutions there. We also did field tests. So this is a coast uh, of uh, Israel. Uh, these are these topologies that we consider with the different uh, acoustic technologies there. These are the models that uh, we use, which I'm sure you have seen some time back. These are pictures of the scenario where we did the trial. These are the <clears throat> results. <clears throat> so there is a, the detailed uh, performance uh, of the different technologies for every single node. Uh, but if you look at the graphs uh, on the bottom, you can see how OMS does better than uh, Aloha. Uh, for example, here you have uh, almost twice as much throughput. In that case, mostly because of the high frequency technology, which can be used uh, much better in OMS than in Aloha. And similarly here for the other topology there. And so the conclusion of this study was that uh, you know, OMS is better than Aloha in, in almost all links, uh, and, and the network overall is definitely higher. It's also more fair. Uh, and uh, it's uh, also been observed that uh, the power consumption is also significantly lower. Um, and these results actually show that, you know, if you adopt a multimodal mindset where you try to optimize things jointly, 
as opposed to just using the highest rate available on any link, uh, this does significantly better. And so the multi-model approach uh, is actually uh, promising. So it's not just, uh, it doesn't fall back on, you know, the divide and conquer type of approach where you first decide what technology is better and then you use that. Uh, doing things jointly, even though the optimization problem is more difficult, gives you uh, better performance there. Uh, I mentioned already using data for post-fact evaluations. So feeding simulations with uh, data acquired in, uh, in uh, field trials. Uh, and these are two papers that do that uh, as an example. Uh, recent trends, I let me not mention this, it's late. So let me actually uh, finish. Uh, these are the, uh, let me see, there was a question. Have you considered exploiting the range limitation of RF and optics? Uh, with transmit collision. Uh, uh, well, we did uh, separately. You don't need to mix the two, right? Because uh, RF and uh, or, or optics and uh, optical do not interfere with each other. So from the point of view of interference, it's like two separate networks. And so there is no need to coordinate them in terms of interference. Uh, you can make your considerations according to you know, what I said at the beginning and apply those considerations to the two techniques uh, uh, separately. So I was saying that uh, here I put a few slides with uh, recent projects that deal with multimodal uh, approaches, uh, just uh, for reference. If you're interested, you may go and look, look them up, look up their website and, uh, and see. So uh, that's in Marling, you know, by, by you know, Northeastern University and the University of Rome uh, Sapienza. This is an EU-funded project in H2020, SWARMS, uh, then an EDA SALSA, so the European Defense Agency, a project where we participate, uh, to, we collaborate with the team of SALSA, uh, doing some simulations there. Uh, CMRE is the NATO center in La Spezia, you probably know. Uh, they have this concept of architecture, which uh, goes uh, in these directions. Then there's a Martera EU-funded project, Undina, that does uh, you know, multimodal communication as well. Then there are papers where you know, the, the first of the list is by Igor and Julia and Enrico and Ian, and most of them are in the room, I guess, and, and others that have been doing. And if you look at the dates of these papers, and it's clear, clear that this topic is actually quite relevant and uh, uh, there is activity in this area. So this, you know, type of uh, scenarios and these type of technologies are definitely of interest and promising for future applications. Many things are still to be handled uh, properly and the problems may become difficult and multidimensional, but clearly uh, at least some preliminary results show that uh, this trend uh, is uh, promising. And so there's a potential to get uh, significantly better performance than using traditional techniques or techniques in isolation. And so this encourages us and hopefully you to uh, go on in this area. And so to conclude, you know, multimodal optical and acoustic networks uh, uh, may be used uh, as enabling technologies for a number of applications, including remote control for robots uh, uh, and, and others that I listed during the presentation. Uh, they provide benefits also to classical applications. Uh, data muling, I never mentioned it, but it's clear that, you know, a lot of what I explained had to do with this concept of data muling, where instead of sending data through the air or through the water, uh, you go and collect it. So you physically go and pick it up and take it back. So in these scenarios where, you know, distance may prevent a communication technology from working uh, and where, you know, you have a delay tolerant kind of behavior, then, you know, the, the good old way of going and picking up things and bringing them back may actually still work in some, in some application areas. And so this is something that is... Uh, often seen in these kind of applications. Uh, to design an optimal multi-border network, we should consider the whole system together, not focusing on individual technologies, because that may be significantly suboptimal. And uh, uh, sim evaluation should be done uh, well with simulations, certainly, because that's the cheap and uh, still quite effective way of doing that if you use the right simulation tool with the right complexity and right level of uh, accuracy. Uh, but, you know, complementing with field experiments is, of course, uh, much, very valuable. Uh, if this should be possible for 
cost reasons, for example, to mention the most obvious reason, uh, if you only use simulation, then you can still uh, uh, use at least real data collected in the field to feed the simulations. And so for that, it may become valuable to produce libraries or databases uh, or data sets that may be formatted in a way that's easily usable and can be made available to the community for uh, you know, shared knowledge and, and benchmarking of different solutions. And so we hope that you know, we're going down that way. And so more data will become available globally to the community so that even groups that do not have the possibility of running a, a C campaign may still be able to produce uh, significant and relevant research in this area. And so with that, let me stop. I guess I'm a few minutes late, but I trust this is not a big problem. And uh, I'm here if I have any question. As I mentioned, my email is given at the bottom of this slide, and I'll be happy to take questions now or over email in the next few days. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Michele. Really very, very interesting and clear presentation. And uh, I see also many topics um, uh, in common, also possible way of collaboration so for the future. Uh, really many different lines. So all the people here in the room they were very much <laughs> interested to your presentation. Uh, I think uh, there are a um, few questions. So, so for instance, uh, one from uh, Igor. Uh, Andrew, I think that you can also I mean, uh, switch on the microphone of uh, Igor. Anyway, I can start uh, reading the question if you want. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. So if we compare optical mode to acoustic mode, we can see over 1,000 times difference in communication speed in terms of both data rates and propagation speed. Acoustic mode also reached longer range and can potentially cause more interference for denser networks. Do you think, is it still relevant to use the acoustic mode for the control traffic, or we better reduce its usage to the extent, uh, to the extent possible? Well, uh, I would give uh, <clears throat> two answers to that. So the first is that if your remote device is two kilometers away, there is no way you can reach it by optical communications. No way. And so there are situations where optical communication is completely unavailable. And so acoustics is the only possibility. And so in that, unless you decide that you only focus on very small, I mean, uh, in size, in, in geographical size networks, where optics can still be used uh, for all communications, then you have to use acoustics. For, for the other. And this is especially relevant for the scenario of the data muling scenario I was mentioning earlier, where the size of the area is too big for optical, but optical is very much useful when you have close proximity type of data exchange, because there you can speed it up very significantly. And so this is uh, one of the best examples of how the two technologies may work jointly. Now, the second question is uh, that, you know, you may still want to use optical communications for control when you're close enough and you may well do it. Uh, or you can say that since optical communication, I'm sorry, uh, control communication messages are, you know, can be supported by acoustic communication because of the low data rate requirements they have. And given that uh, even at small distances, acoustic communications may actually be more robust than optics, you may still decide to use acoustic communication for control in all cases, even when you could have a good optical channel and uh, leave the optical communications only for uh, you know, bulk data exchange or heavy, heavy duty type of uh, communication scenarios. Also, logically, this could be you know, more easily handled, uh, but uh, you know, there's no definite conclusion here you you may do, do your uh, make your choice according to what you prefer but the first answer still holds right because if you're dealing with a scenario which is not as small as uh, within the coverage range of optical which is you know no more than tens of meters uh, in that case uh, acoustics becomes a necessity not a choice thank you so much this is clear yeah thank you uh-huh.
Now, there was another question, a first question by Andrea Infanti. I don't know if you want to read it, uh, Julia, or should I read it? Exactly. Range so, can, yes, I can read if you want. Have you considered exploiting the range limitation of radio frequency and optic to avoid the transmission collisions in multi agent and swarm scenarios? Yeah, are there existing studies? Oh, this, yeah, there was actually the, the question I was answering earlier, right? I think. Yeah. Exactly. That, yeah that, that, so the range limitation to avoid transmission collision is multi-agent swarm scenarios. Uh, yeah, as I said earlier, I mean the, the two the two technologies uh, work from the point of view of interference work independently. Okay, and so uh, yes, you have to deal with interference uh, in, in all scenarios, uh, uh, and and you do that by taking into account the range limitations or, or coverage range of different technologies versus the density of the nodes. Uh, if it comes to that, you may even consider uh, power control type of uh, uh, techniques. Uh, if uh, you know sending at full power will interfere a hundred of nodes, uh, then you may want to keep it down to to reduce that. Uh, but uh, yes, interference is certainly one of the main issues when dealing with uh, wireless communication in general and other wireless communication in particular. And so. Uh, studies uh, need to be made but there are there are quite a few studies uh, there and and this is more relevant for acoustics i would say than uh, than optical uh, because in optical usually you have a, a very focused communication so being this very directional uh, the effect of interference is very much reduced uh, unless you are you know, unlucky enough to be aligned with the communication link and so to be interfered by those. But it takes, you know, a transmitter which is pointing towards you and at the same time, you pointing towards the transmitter if you want to uh, be interfered. And so this is much more unlikely. It's the same that we see, you know, at uh, a millimeter wave or terahertz communications for wireless uh, that, you know, interference becomes less and less of a problem uh, because of the directionality of the transmission. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, any other question? Great. So essentially, how do you see the future of underwater networks? Uh, it's very much on the multimodal uh, way, I guess, <laughs> as you saw. Yeah, uh, yeah I think uh, it's because, you know, this, this uh, um, more sophisticated scenarios uh, where you have uh, you know, multi-layer type of uh, applications, uh, multiple needs coexisting, like the control and navigation, the uh, maybe a slideshow of images, uh, some high-speed data for, for sensor or, or, or control, maybe even video and, and things like that. Uh, so this, you know, opened the way to interesting scenarios that may, still, may be addressed here. Of course, the traditional the communication needs will still be there. And, and of course, you know, if we can deal with them only acoustically, uh, so be it. Uh, there is no need to put optical everywhere. But uh, what, what is interesting, I think, is that, uh, you know, we seem to have a, a new field uh, where we can uh, imagine things that we haven't so far. And so maybe new opportunities uh, will arise, both for research and uh, maybe even commercially at some point. And so this is uh, quite exciting in my view. Yeah, definitely. And uh, in terms of uh, essentially in, uh, video transmission and the real time, uh, if we are in a long range uh, setting, let's say, um, uh, essentially we are facing uh, all the limitations of acoustics, right? You were saying, for instance, that we can split an image on uh, different packets. But essentially, this will produce a delay on top of the delay of the uh, propagation itself. Essentially, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, do you see any way, essentially, to uh, partially overcome these limitations in order to be more real time as possible? I mean, optical is definitely the the, the way to go there, right? Because you have high speed and you have uh, low latency. Uh, Unless you have to shape the traffic, as I was showing in one of the one of the uh, results in one of the papers, uh, then traffic shaping may introduce delays. Uh, but that is because you want the system to work fairly. Not, uh, not it's not a drawback, but it's a choice. Uh, but 
we, we also must uh, face the reality that you know these technologies have uh, inherent physical limitations and you know, as, as hard as you can try uh, you can't beat the law of physics right beyond a certain point and so uh, it's better to just see what can be done in multiple dimensions and try to you know uh, choose the one technology which is most adequate to what you're trying to do uh, but of course, if you want uh, high speed uh, and low latency video transmission over acoustics, uh, uh, you know, good luck if you want to try, but uh, it's, it's very unlikely you can succeed, right? So it's, we also have to be realistic. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, yeah, any other right. question? Oh, I don't think so. Well, we really enjoyed right. your presentation, extremely mm -hmm. clear you. and uh, wide spectrum. Yes, if hopefully, you share this yeah. live, yeah. sure, I will send them to you. Yeah, and hopefully, next time we can be in Abu Dhabi, all exactly, of us. Exactly, <laughs> we wait for you. Looking forward we hope <laughs> to meet in person. With you. Okay, very, very good to have you here. Right. So. Okay, well, thank you, thank you, Julia, thank you, Enrico, and thank you, everyone.